Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining DiVentures today for episode two of our Oceans Update webinar series, Understanding Coral Reef Fishes. My name is Sabrina Severin, and I am the Ocean Health Education and Conservation Coordinator here at DiVentures. I received my master's degree in marine conservation from the University of Miami, and I've been with DiVentures for a little over a year now. I am thrilled to introduce you today to our host, Dr. Alex Brilski. Dr. Alex Brilski is the founder of Ocean Education International, which is a consulting firm focusing on environmental education and professional development for the marine tourism industry, specializing in the recreational scuba sector. He is also currently the director of education at ReefSmart and is also the author of The Complete Diver and Beneath the Blue Planet, and both of those books can be purchased at your local DaVentures. Dr. Brilski holds a Master of Arts in Instructu Instructural Systems Design, a Master of Science in Marine Biology and Coastal Zone Management, and an EDS and PhD in Science Education with a Technical Specialty in Oceanography. He has a unique and diverse background that combines education and marine conservation, and we are honored to share this knowledge and passion with you today. I hope you enjoy this webinar and the important information shared. Dr. Broski, the floor is all yours. Uh, I need to hire you as my PR agent, by the way. Uh, well, welcome to those of you who are with us for the first time, and welcome back to those of you who were with us last month. And we're going to continue with our discussion of coral reefs, but I checked the weather this morning, and I, I'm sure many of you are anticipating <laughs> yet another winter storm, and you're just, uh, you know, just as well would prefer to talk about coral reefs and things of, <clears throat> of that nature. And I came across kind of an interesting little uh, uh, tidbit in uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who uh, wrote uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. He was a futurist, and many people don't realize he was a very avid scuba diver. Uh, and he actually made a comment that you hear once in a while. <clears throat> he said that how inappropriate it is to call our planet Earth when it is so obviously ocean. And it reflects my own feeling that, you know, you really cannot get away from the influence of the ocean, no matter where you live, even if it's Omaha. So uh, let me let me prove that to you. So from a geological perspective, we're never really too far from the ocean. If you lived about 77,000 years ago, this was North America. And you'll notice a distinctive feature is that most of what we now call the United States is underwater. Uh, and if you lived in Omaha, which would be right there, uh, while you may have had a Tyrannosaurus for a neighbor, you might also have had a waterfront property. Uh, and so, indeed, we, we never really can get too far from the ocean. And I just thought that was a good perspective, given that so many of you, I, I'm sure, are concentrated in the uh, inland areas. Uh, and we'll actually come back to that in, in future episodes. But anyway. Uh, as I had, as I did in the past, I, I want to start off with a segment I call "In the News" because there, there were some very interesting things happening. And uh, those of you that are aware of uh, shark diving have probably heard of Guadalupe Island. And if you haven't, uh, here is a little map of Baja California, and about 200 miles offshore is Guadalupe Island. The news is that uh, while this has been one of the most uh, popular cage diving uh, locations for great white sharks, uh, it's been closed. And it's been closed essentially what they what could be uh, permanently. And this, of course, has caused great concern, et cetera, because it's been one of the areas that's popularized sharks. And they, they've not been yet forth, too forthcoming with the reasons, but the only thing that I could glean from their news release is that, as you see, the plan says that, it's, that this is uh, because bad practices have been observed. And I, I, this this in, uh, inspired me to take a look, and I, I did hear about it and finally found a, a little segment that uh, kind of shows what might have contributed to this. This is a video, uh, for, uh, actually a YouTube channel called uh, uh, Bucket List Family. And here we have a five and seven year old being taken into car the shark cage. And here we have a five-year-old kid down there. Uh, and as you'll see throughout the sequence, uh, this is uh, this is what's happening. Now, 
it's interesting. The comments that that were that I saw on the YouTube channel were very uh, positive, and you know what a wonderful experience. Uh, my own opinion is this: this borders on child abuse. Uh, there's no way a kid can make an, an informed consent decision to do this. Uh, plus, if you're if you're really keep in t in touch with this, uh, there have been instances where some of these whites have actually uh, come through the cage. In fact, one was was uh, uh, received a lot of press and, and video coverage. Now, if that were to happen, uh, as it did happen, the, the shark was more interested in getting out of the circumstance than you know having any uh, having <laughs> attacking the diver. The, the diver was not uh, injured in the process. But the point is or my point is that, you know, the, the pendulum may in fact have swung pretty far. When I, I remember the, when JAWS was introduced, uh, was premiered back in 1975, I was a scuba instructor. And back then, you know, you really couldn't find a scuba student unless you held a gun at their head. It really, really had the pendulum to the side where people basically felt a good shark uh, was a dead shark. And over the intervening decades, it's begun to swing much more to the other side, to the point where I think that most informed people realize that sharks are important, they're vital, and in fact, it's something that we want to see as divers. But I also, we need to caution, be cautious about this idea that the pendulum may have swung too far in the other direction. So again, this is just a, uh, for what it's worth, uh, perspective. And I'll, I'll keep you posted on what's happening with this uh, shark ban. Oh, in the, in the realm of sharks, uh, another uh, positive step, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Gallagher, who is a researcher uh, from, from actually University of Miami, uh, has been attaching webcams to cameras uh, to, to, to tiger sharks for some time for various reasons. And this one they tracked uh, throughout the Bahamas. And it recorded what is the, what is the largest arena or area of uh, seagrass beds that's ever been found. So here we see an, an example of how research into one animal and its behavior is really providing a broad perspective in an ecosystem that we we have no uh, very little uh, understanding of, at least in terms of its of its uh, distribution. And by the way, all of the articles that I'm discussing, uh, the source links are available on the uh, Oceans Update web website. Another interesting story, uh, those of you that have been to Roatan or Utila, you've been nearby, but uh, on, the, on the mainland, there is an area uh, known as Tela Bay. Uh, it's not noted and never has been noted as a dive destination because the uh, several rivers uh, run into the bay. It's very turbid and no one ever suspected there was any reef there at all. And it turns out one of the healthiest reefs ever identified in the Caribbean exists in these, what you would otherwise assume to be pretty challenging conditions. And the article is quite interesting. And there's a, a lot of research going on to understand just how these ecosystems can thrive in conditions that we thought were you know, uh, impossible for coral reefs. Shows you how little we really know. Uh, I talked about the stony coral tissue loss disease uh, last month, and there was suspicion, and still is, that one of the vectors that has spread the disease is ballast water from, from ships. Now, ships, when they don't have much cargo, will take on water in order to get lower and more stable in the water column. And of course, when they get to a port where they want to unload cargo, they want to offload the water. And whatever was in that water uh, when they took it on is going to be in that water when they when they disperse it. And the the pattern of distribution of the disease was counter to the flow of currents in the Caribbean region. And the suspect uh, in this regard was ballast water. And this this is a, a paper that uh, seems to uh, support that uh, hypothesis as well. And then lastly, a very interesting uh, story that shows you just how related everything is. There, were, there was a group of Australian and, and British scientists who were looking at the behavior of the jeweled damselfish you see depicted there in the center. And uh, what they were wondering is why their uh, protection of their, uh, their algal patches, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, why they seem to be more protective in some regions and others. And it turned out, 
and they they had a hypothesis that these islands, very remote islands that they studied in the Indian Ocean, some had been uh, infested with rats by uh, uh, mariners who've gone there years, decades of the past. And when the problem with a rat infestation in, a, in an island environment is that they're they're highly predatory and they they eat the eggs and the chicks and so and as a result the the bird populations just are decimated and so they they picked a island where there was essentially far few, very few birds and lots of rats and then an island that had been rat free as it were and they in fact found that there was a definite correlation in just how protective these little jewel these little jewel damselfish were in that the, the islands that had lots of good uh, bird populations, uh, they were much more protective. They went further away from their, their, their home, so to speak, uh, to protect their algal gardens. And they did not show the same protection in the islands that were rat infested. And they did uh, uh, stable isotope analysis. And they found you know, the, the nutritional value of the algae with the, uh, if the rat infested islands was relatively sparse, poor, and the uh, algae based upon nutrients from the birds was quite high. So in a sense, it's like, you know, what, what's worth protecting? If, if, are you protecting a field of lettuce or are you protecting a herd of cows? And the higher valued uh, 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 algae was uh, more resources were put into protecting it. So I just bring this to bear because we will talk a little bit more about this and it's just interesting just how interrelated I think uh, uh, the world really is. Anyway, so much for the news. Uh, what we want to really talk about uh, this afternoon is, as uh, Sabrina mentioned, is understanding coral reef fishes. But I, I want to start by a little bit of a, of a, a grammar, grammatical lesson. Uh, you're going to hear me use the term fish and fishes. And to, to be uh, totally uh, accurate, ichthyologists refer to fishes in the plural when they refer to the same species. So that, that school of uh, a surgeon fish would be appropriate, even though there are many of them. When it's multiple species, it's fishes. So that school of fishes over there is, contains surgeon fish, parrot fish, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll, you'll kind of understand where I'm coming from in that regard. Let's look at the big picture. And this may be familiar to you from last month. We saw that corals, uh, coral species are highly concentrated within the area we call the, the coral triangle, which is depicted here. Uh, this one is not corals, but fish species. But once again, you see this high concentration of fish species in the coral triangle. And as you move away from the coral triangle, uh, the species diversity starts to drop off very, very significantly. Uh, and I would also call to your attention, this is what I, in fact, for me, this is, a, this is a bucket list destination. I've been fortunate to have been there a couple of times, but this is the area where you will find upwards of 14 to 1500 different species of fish uh, in a single location. And in fact, there, there are a couple of trips uh, that I saw from the website, uh, Komodo, which I've been to, uh, and then the, uh, the Livermore trip on the Aruni, uh, as well, this is really the, the biodiversity hotspot of the world. And if you do have a chance to go there someday, please, please take it. The other, the other reason this is such a hotspot is has to do with both the climate and the ocean itself physically. Uh, on the left, you see depicted what's known as the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. And this is the way the ocean currents are connected to the, the wind-induced surface and the density induced uh, deep currents of the ocean. Every couple of millennia, the entire ocean circulates through this pattern. And you'll notice when it's at the surface in the warm tropics of the Pacific, it comes uh, careening right through the coral triangle. So the dispersal of, of larvae, et cetera, is really ideal. Uh, the other climate issue is that you may be, not be unaware of it, but the Coriolis effect is zero on the equator. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the, the hurricanes are far, far less likely to be near the equator. In fact, if you, if you notice, they either turn to the right or clockwise in the Northern hemisphere 
and to the left or uh, counterclockwise. In the, and so you see this region directly on the equator that I won't say never gets a hurricane, but they're, they're very, very uncommon. So the stability and the oceanographic conditions really make the coral triangle a hotbed for diversity, including with reef fishes. If you want to know more about the uh, ocean conveyor belt, uh, chapter three of my, my new book uh, talks about that. Anyway, let's get to this. Uh, the first time people learn coral reefs, I think is pretty overwhelming because they, they get in the water. If they're fortunate enough to see a, a scene like this, they're just overwhelmed to the point where they think this is chaos. There can't possibly be any method to the madness for this hodgepodge of life. And of course there is, they just have not yet under, uh, come to understand what's going on because there is in fact uh, a good deal of reason why these fishes look the way they do, behave the way they do as well. And that's really one what I want to get into. Uh, and there, there, there are hints about this, even if we have no idea what the fish is. And the first hint I always encourage people is to understand that tails tell a tale. And you can kind of see with this, uh, this tuna on the left and the angelfish on the right, their tails are quite different. And in fact, they, they differ in terms of their relation to, to height versus width or aspect ratio. Uh, the take home is pretty simple. The more curved or lunate, the easier it is for the, for the tail to wash back and forth. And therefore that's a speed tail. So when you see a fish with that lunate tail, you know it's a speedster. On the other end of the continuum, you see that rounded, uh, lunate uh, rounded, rounded, uh, more truncated tail. And that, of course, has more resistance. It's more difficult to move through the water. And so that indicates a slower moving fish. But there's an advantage, and it makes the fish more maneuverable. So we're trading off speed for maneuverability as the tail changes. And we see that not only in reef fishes, but even in sharks. Uh, two good examples, uh, the tiger on the top and the uh, poor beagle on the, on the bottom. The tiger shark has a more maneuverable tail, and it's referred to as asymmetrical uh, uh, heterocycle, tail, heterocycle tail. And uh, it makes sense because it hunts uh, everything from uh, turtles to stingrays, things that require lots of movement and, and maneuverability, et cetera. By contrast, the poor beagle is an open ocean uh, fish eater, and all they're concerned with is chasing down fish in order to capture them. So we see this reflected in, in virtually all species. The other telltale sign of, of any fish is its mouth. And you can see that there are obviously highly specialized mouths, and it's not, it's not happenstance, as we'll see. There is a reason for the mouth, as we'll get into in a minute. And so the real take home here is that form follows function, that the way a fish looks, the way it behaves is directly attributable to what it's going, what it has to consume. Even here, as we'll talk about with this, uh, with this trumpet fish and this lurking uh, uh, grouper, the way they, be, they behave and it is determined by what they eat. This is actually a, uh, an alligator fish, it's, or I'm sorry, a crocodile fish from the uh, Red Sea. So, but, so let's talk about food just briefly. I, I discussed this a bit last week, but basically you've got a Chinese menu on a coral reef in terms of what food is available. And it can be plant food, grazers. Uh, detritus is just a collective term we use in science for anything that's decaying. So anything that decays, or in the process of decaying, enters what we call the detrital food web. So there, and there are organisms, mainly invertebrates, that eat that. Uh, believe it or not, corals produce an enormous amount of mucus, as do other organisms. That mucus uh, is consumable by not only small little microscopic critters, but even larger ones. There's plankton in the water, not much, based upon our discussion last month, but there is plankton, uh, particularly at night. And of course, there's lots of fish to consume. Uh, and so by and large, the, the menu is set. And so the question is, what will I eat if I'm a fish? Now, in understanding organisms, <laughs> there are two things you can look at, what they eat and how they reproduce, because that's really the function of evolution, to 
survive long enough to reproduce and to survive, you need to eat. And what I encourage divers to do is to literally follow the food chain and look at the fish categories according to what we call guilds. Now, what do I mean by a guild? Guilds were the organizations back in the, in the late Middle Ages where all the stonemasons and carpenters, et cetera, they formed their organizations to protect their, their, their livelihood. And it took years and years in order to uh, become a guild member. Uh, but the important thing is that while all of the guild members did the same thing, they had the same function, they were not related. And ichthyologists use the same concept in understanding the ecology of reef fishes. So let's take a look at, a, at, at the, the reef from that perspective, starting with the base. The base of every food web uh, is going to come from the energy from the sun and plants or algae will make that first step in what we call primary production. So there's lots of benthic. Benthic, by the way, just means bottom. Uh, there's a lot of detritus. There's things that die that haven't been eaten that are going to continue to decompose and become food for something else. And there isn't much, but there's some phytoplankton out there as well. So with this as the base, let's take a look at how these, this guild must, must operate. The first guild we'll call the, the, the herbivores. These are the plant eaters. And the typical fishes are the parrots, some of the damsels, not all, and the, and the surgeons. If you go to the Indo-Pacific, you'll find a, a family of fish called rabbit fishes, which do not exist in the, in the Atlantic. And so that is our herbivore guild. Now, once the herbivores are in the picture, they become food, potentially, for the, la the larger piscivores, the big guys, the sharks, the big grouper, uh, barracuda, et cetera. Detritus is not consumed by many fishes directly, uh, but instead it's consumed primarily by invertebrates. So you've got the invertebrates bringing in the detritus into the web. And then we have what are called the benthivores, literally meaning the bottom feeders. These are uh, 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 the fishes that feed on invertebrates, uh, uh, butterflies, uh, grunts, a lot of the box fishes, the puffers, uh, et cetera. And then of course they become potential food. Uh, the few detritivores that do exist tend to be the little blennies and the gobies you see, uh, some of the surgeons. They in turn become uh, food for what we call the small piscivores, the snappers, the uh, uh, fishes such as the grazebees and the, the trumpet fishes. Now the phytoplankton, as I mentioned last week, is too small for any fish to really see it. So it has to be brought into the system first by being consumed by larger zooplankton or animal plankton. Those, of course, are large enough, but, but the corals actually get the lion's share there because they are voracious uh, uh, plankton eaters. And therefore, we have a guild called the corillivores that are specialized in eating the corals. Butterfly fishes primarily, certainly parrots, some filefish, and in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Moorish idols. We do not have Moorish idols in the Atlantic. They, of course, become food for that, for the next level. And then there are planktivores. There are fishes that make their living by eating those little zooplankton that you see there. And so you, you see the, the kind of the more complete picture of the, the guild association in a coral reef uh, ecosystem. So what I want to do now is kind of take a look at the individuals and see how these form, function, and relationships kind of operate. One of the more interesting relationships, of course, some of you may have seen, is the symbiosis between cleaners and, and their host. And in the lower left, you see the neon blenny uh, famously cleaning the uh, moray eel. Uh, here with this big eye, uh, another uh, uh, blenny. And on the upper uh, image, you see the, uh, uh, the hogfish being cleaned. These neon blennies are very, very common. And they, this process is quite important. It's been documented clearly uh, that on reefs that have a, a good presence of cleaning stations, there's a, a decrease in, or there's an increase in the health of the fish. They do, because they're eating parasites, they're eating lesions, dead skin, et cetera. 
Uh, Jim Abernathy, who is a, a well-known uh, shark specialist, uh, uh, posted this video of a remora cleaning the inside of a shark's mouth. And then uh, a common uh, critter called a Pedersen's cleaning shrimp here is uh, doing a pretty good job on this Nassau grouper. By the way, if you're patient, they will, they'll even do this to divers. My wife has many experiences. With them. So that's cleaning behavior, which is certainly you know very, very remarkable and, and uh, interesting. Now, the other behavioral issue uh, with regard to food uh, has a great bearing on the way fish <laughs> act underwater. And I bring your attention not to a marine environment, but let's go to the African savanna. What do you see typically in a video of the African savanna? You see lots of wildebeest, lots of, of a zebra that are constantly out there foraging, but you don't see the lions or the cheetahs very often. And that in part is due to the nutritional value of what they're consuming. If you're a herbivore, you're eating plants. If you remember high school biology, that means these are cells surrounded by cellulose uh, walls, which is difficult to break down. Uh, and likewise, the nutritional value of a plant is, not, is less than it would be of an animal. And so the upshot is a herbivore may be able to find lots of food, but they have to be feeding constantly in order to keep that supply going through their, their digestive system. So they're active all the time. We see this with parrotfishes and with surgeons, as I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so behaviorally, you're always gonna see herbivores constantly active. Carnivores, on the other hand, a little bit different. The lions are sleeping. The lions can sometimes sleep 18 hours a day, in fact. And that's because they're consuming meat much higher nutritional value, don't have to worry about this cellulose you know, digestion process. And so they had the advantage of a higher nutritional value and the advantage of not having to eat continually. And this has great implication on uh, reef fish behavior. Now, as I mentioned, these are the primary families of the herbivores, the parrots, the surgeon fishes, of which the blue tang is a member. Uh, some of the damsels, not all, and in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the rabbit fishes. So let's take a look. This is a, a, a school of both Dr. F fish and blue tangs. And you see that they are foraging. Uh, there's a great deal of advantage to schooling because A, it presents a bigger target, so there's a decreased chance of predation. And secondly, it's more efficient because when one section of the school identifies a food source that everybody else sees, hey, that's food, we need to get over there. So there's enormous selective advantage to schooling, uh, particularly for uh, these uh, herbivorous fish. Now, as I said, some of the damsels are herbivores. And while the surgeons, as you just saw, the parrots, are uh, grazers, the damsels are basically farmers. And this is a, uh, I'm gonna show you an image here of my being attacked by a long fin damselfish. So notice as I move in, I'm being attacked. And, and, and the question of course begs, why would a fish 100th my size attempt to attack me. There's got to be something valuable here. And what is at stake is its, its crop. It is a farmer. It is, it is not a grazer. It has invested resources to establish an algal turf garden, and it will do what it can to protect it. In fact, they take some species, and in fact, this particular one has been shown to literally herd tiny little shrimp uh, in order to populate and therefore, you know, defecate and, and fertilize uh, and even prune away the algo that they don't want. Uh, so there is a, a great deal of investment and hence there's a great deal of protection in the process. Uh, you can also see on the left just how different juveniles often look compared to uh, their adults. So interesting little fish. Uh, one coral reef scientist said that pound for pound, damselfish are the most dangerous one on the reef. Here we see this very large parrotfish being attacked 
by the damsel because it's just too close to its algal garden. And you think that's remarkable. Here comes an octopus on the left. And Mr. Dam Mr. Mr. <laughs> both Mr. and Mrs. Damselfish say, get out of here. So these are, are quite cantankerous little critters. And uh, so, yes, you will be attacked as divers, but not by sharks. You'll be attacked probably by damselfishes. Now, of course, if you've been diving on reefs, you've probably seen this behavior. This is the largest parrotfish in the Atlantic. This is the midnight parrotfish. Listen if you can. I'm not sure how well the recordings come across, but you'll actually hear the crunching. And so they're they're harvesting the the turf algaes that and uh, the macroalgaes that cover the reef. They sometimes predate the uh, the coral itself. And here's the second largest. This is the rainbow parrot. So what makes this so effective is this is what they're using. They have four uh, fused teeth essentially uh, that continually grow. Uh, they scrape. And in fact, in the back of their throat, they have a grinding, what's referred to as pharyngeal mill, that grind the coarser material down to a fine powder so it, it doesn't uh, injure their digestive, tr digestive tract process. Very interesting little critters. Very important critters as well. Uh, and here is the sign uh, from uh, Baja Mexico reads, these are too important to eat essentially. And I'll, I'll get to that uh, a little later in the discussion. But uh, these are protected in Florida. In fact, uh, in the US, we, we don't tend to eat parrotfish at all, uh, but they are consumed voraciously around the world. And it's one of the problems because these are a, a major lawnmower for the reef that keeps the uh, algae in check. Now, let's get back to these benthivores for a second. They eat invertebrates. Now, if you think about it, invertebrates are often crunchy. They have uh, uh, either hard shells or structures. And so you've got to be uh, pretty specialized in order to deal with that. In fact, uh, in, in ichthyology, we, we call these kinds of critters durophagus, meaning they have the ability to eat hard stuff. Now, to do that, let's think about this structurally. In order to find and locate and target invertebrates, which aren't going to move very fast, if at all, they have to have the ability to move her precisely. So that you'll notice in this peacock uh, triggerfish, they don't, they have that very uh, blunt tail, which is not for speed, but for maneuverability. You'll also notice in many of the benthivores, they have really well articulating pectoral fins that allow them to turn and maneuver and, and, and really kind of spin on their own axis. They need close uh, vision. Uh, and because they're not fast, they better have some good defense mechanisms. And here in the case of the triggers, uh, they have the reason it's called a trigger fish. They have this spine on the front, uh, in the front of the, the fore dorsal that they can erect making it very unpleasant if something were to come in and, and chomp them, or they'll sometimes hunker back into the reef and they'll erect that spine, making it difficult for them to be pulled out. And they have uh, kind of bony plates, as we'll see in a minute, under their, their skin. So they're not, they're not a very desirable fish for a piscivore, which makes sense. And that's how they survive in this specialized kind of world. Now, uh, the triggers, one species of trigger is quite famous, and I'll just show you why it's quite famous. Here is a snorkeler just leisurely moving on. All of a sudden, ba -da -da, attack time. This is a titan trigger, and it's, in fact, it's a male titan trigger. They will protect the egg, the egg clutch of the female in kind of a, a funnel pattern from the, from the, from the nest uh, outward toward the surface. And they'll they'll be very very tenacious. In fact, I was attacked in the Red Sea once, much to the amusement of my wife and the dive master, uh, in a very similar situation. And what you have coming at you, as you see right here, is a, a pretty serious uh, kind of a mouth. So when when you are perhaps warned about Titan triggers, if you ever visit the Indo Pacific, uh, heed that advice, or otherwise it'll be a very entertaining and possibly. Uh, <clears throat> humorous uh, uh, experience for your dive buddy. Back in the durophagus 
you say, well, you know, how how formidable can these critters be in crunching things? Well, I'll show you how formidable formidable this little balloon fish is with a crab. They also have bony plates uh, in the roof of their mouth that allow them to crush. On the left, this little trunk fish has a different strategy using uh, its squirting water, a water jet out of its mouth, dislodging little invertebrates from the sand. And you see the little rats kind of trying to get a free meal in the process. Uh, and you see, you see that it looks like it's a little tri triangular, the most <laughs> uh, inefficient hydrodynamic design, design uh, but very, very able to maneuver uh, and very much able to capture what its intended uh, uh, prey item is. And the various puffer fishes, the balloon fishes and porcupine fishes, et cetera, uh, all have the same issue. You see those pectoral fins are really, really to uh, articulate a, a really you know, fine movement and do what they need to do. Of course, they can expand the, and either project or maintain uh, spines that are projected. But underneath, another reason they're not very palatable is that uh, their, their skeleton is quite elaborate. And it's not really, you know, a desirable food item for an, another piscivorous fish. Angel fishes, you'll see they have a very uh, unique structure to their jaw, able to uh, very meticulously uh, munch. This one's at a coral nursery. Angel fishes are also kind of unique in that they are one of the few uh, sponge eaters on the reef. Sponges do not have a great deal of nutritional value, and they have all kinds of little spicules, little calcium carbonate and silica structures inside. Uh, but uh, angelfish with that particular uh, jaw configuration can consume them quite well. And if you observe it, you can see signs of angelfish predation on sponges quite commonly. Here are the two most common spongivores, uh, all species of the angels. And here we have a hawksbill turtle. If you see major damage on a sponge, and you, it's obviously not from an anchor or a diver, uh, almost invariably it's a hawksbill turtle. The Butterfly fishes have a very tiny, very specialized mouth because some species only eat the polyps of, of corals. In the, in the Pacific, there are many species of such. In the Atlantic, we have fewer species, none of which eat only corals, but they, they can do that. And the reason they can do that, their family name, Ketodontidae, means cone tooth. And under a microscope here, you see the teeth you know, the inside the mouth of, the, of, a, of a fish, and these tiny little comb-like structures that allow them to be so delicate and precise in actually being able to target a single coral polyp. Now, at night, things change because, uh, as you may be aware, aware of, when night falls, the shift changes, and many of the daytime active or di diurnal fish uh, don't really go to sleep, but they, they rest. Uh, and then the shift changes to the nocturnal species. Now, the nocturnal species tend to be red because red essentially without any light at night is invisible. Uh, and if you're hunting at night, you want to take good advantage of what minimal light there may be. So they tend to have very big eyes. And they also tend to have very big mouths because you, beggars can't be choosers at night whatever they come upon they want to be able to deal with. And so you tend to see those general characteristics in the squirrel fishes, the big eyes, and, and the uh, other nocturnal uh, species. The other phenomenon that uh, hopefully you'll get to see at some point 
with a parrot fish. As I said, fish don't really go into a true state of sleep, but they do go into a rest of state. And in particular, the parrot fishes engage in what's referred to as cocooning. And here we see a parrot fish extruding a cocoon through its mouth, from its mouth. And uh, over time, it will completely encapsulate the fish. Now, we believe, though I, I'm not quite certain it's been documented, that this is a, a strategy to prevent its scent from being distributed and therefore being hunted by smell. Uh, there's also some indication it may be uh, protective in terms of uh, parasites, et cetera. Now, it takes time for this to happen. So you will not see this on the typical night dive where you're getting in the water at, uh, at, at, uh, at sunset. Uh, my advice, when possible, dive as late as possible. You know, some of the best night dives I've ever been on have been midnight or later, because it takes time for this transition to take place for the all of the nighttime cast to be there. And secondly, uh, just for the cocooning to take place with the, uh, with the parents. But it's a really interesting phenomenon. The Pisivores, uh, the little chromis, the, 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 the blue chromis in particular, you see that forked tail built for speed? Why do you need speed if you're not going to eat other fish? Well, you need to get away from other fish. And so they have this ability to be camouflaged. Blue is a great color if you're going to be up in the water column getting first dibs with the plankton. Uh, and tend, you'll tend to see the planktivores up away from the reef, but able to escape very quickly uh, for shelter. The other uh, approach for a planktivore is to hunk, hunker down near the bottom, find a little cubby hole, and then pop out when necessary. This little yellowhead wrasse, of course, is doing just that. On the right, this, this is an image I took in uh, Palau years ago. And uh, different species of these jawfishes will co-occupy their burrows with these uh, shrimp in the genus Alpheus. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the shrimp is blind, uh, but it's the excavator. It keeps the burrow uh, clean and open, but it keeps an antenna in constant contact with the fish, re realizing that when the fish moves, it's got to retreat as well. And it's fascinating uh, to, uh, to observe. Uh, many of these pisivores have specialized jaws that allow them to reach out, you know, a few uh, you know, centimeters, capture and grab very precisely. The champion of all this is the sling jaw, which is a Pacific species. You don't see this in the Atlantic, but here's what a sling jaw can do. That's a protrusive jaw. And so it's a, a good adaptation if you're going to be a very selective feeder like a, a planktivore. Other planktivores you you'll tend to see, uh, actually, uh, uh, most of these are in the Caribbean. The fusiliers are in the Pacific. And here we have the Sergeant Major, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a bit uh, more. We then come to the carnivores. And these are the fish that eat fish. And because there are so many fishes that do that, there are many strategies that they employ so that they kind of partition the resource and they, they don't compete as you know necessarily with everyone else. And basically there are three hunting strategies, pursuit, stalking, and ambush. Uh, pursue means literally to you know, get out there quickly and, and fast. Stalk of course means to be stealthy. And then the ambushers are those that are just going to wait. Uh, and we see, for example, in that image, if you didn't see the uh, uh, the little grouper, uh, it's waiting uh, for a meal. So let's take a little little look here. Whoops, I duplicated that slide. Apologies. Uh, here's an ambush predator. It's a night dive. That's a Goliath grouper in the background. A uh, fish will come by thinking it's a rock or something. And da, 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 da. boom, it's gone. Pay attention quickly. Boom. That's a jack. That's classic pursuit behavior. Look at that tail. Here's a stalker. Here's a trumpet fish. Imagine if you were the target, the only thing you would see as it approached you was this tiny little circle. You wouldn't notice, be able to see the large structure of the fish itself. 
And so it's just going to meander around, sometimes hide and maybe mimic a soft coral and then strike when that, when capable. And then the last thing I want to show you here is what's referred to as shadow stalking. The, the parrotfish is a herbivore. It's being followed closely by a chrysivore, a, a uh, trumpet fish. And of course, the advantage is a fish would, rec would recognize the herbivore as not a threat, not realizing that just behind it was, in fact, a predator. And that's actually a quite common. Uh, the other thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that sometimes mimicry is, is utilized. And here you see some examples. We have the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the leaf uh, scorpion fish circled. Otherwise, you would think that was a piece of, uh, of you know, debris on the bottom. You see on the left-hand side, the Halamita ghost pipe fish. It looks like a species of algae that we talked about last week. Uh, and then one of the most interesting, we have the common cleaner wrasse, but there is a mimicker. There is a fish, as you see in the, in the middle there, called a, a saber-tooth blenny. And it looks like the cleaner wrasse when it is trying to mimic it. And rather than clean, it will rush in, take a bite out of the fish, and then swim away. So it's actually using its mimicry as a predatory strategy. And what's really bizarre is if they are not engaged in that activity, they don't look like they do in the middle image. They look like they do in the bottom image. So there's quite a bit of control in this regard as well. It's interesting with the, the cleaner uh, wrasses, this little blue streak, there, been a, there was a recent paper published uh, using a mirror and animal intelligence researchers use recognition as a sign of animal, animal intelligence. And it, it showed that it did indeed have had, it, it demonstrated self-recognition, which had never been uh, demonstrated uh, before uh, in, uh, in this species or any uh, fish of that size. The one that we tend to see quite a bit of and a major target for uh, photographers, the frogfish. And then, <clears throat> can you see it? Pectoral fins, eyes, at a different angle. Here we see a scorpion fish. So these are masters of, uh, of disguise and divers are often startled when the, the rock next to them begins to swim. So excellent camouflage for an ambush hunter. Likewise, camouflage uh, depends on context. <clears throat> and so we see the fish, the little humbug damselfish here on the left. How could that be camouflaged? Well, here's how it could be camouflaged. In its natural environment in these branching corals, it's really a good camouflage. So you're seeing the camouflage out of context on the right side. Uh, Not terribly pleasant, but an important relationship in marine ecosystems is coprophagy, which literally is poo eating. A good way to get kids involved in, in, uh, in coral reef science, by the way. Understand that, that uh, excrement from one organism can still have the nutritional value sufficient to support something else, because only certain, a certain level of, uh, of energy can be extracted. And that doesn't mean that something else isn't better at it. Additionally, these droppings become coated with uh, mucus, microbes, et cetera, and become nutritionally much more, uh, much better than when they first uh, came out. And we also know that even urine from fishes that's excreted as they're in the reef has an important nutritional value. And they've, they've looked at, at ecosystems that are overfished and found that part of the nutrient, uh, uh, lack of nutrients uh, comes from this lack of source from fishes. And probably the most famous and well-known issue here <clears throat> has to do with parrotfish that excrete some sometimes upwards of a, you know, almost a thousand pounds of, of excrement. But I also emphasize that because I hear a lot that people mention that well, you know, coral reef uh, uh, beaches and coral reefs are parrotfish poo. That's in part true. But another important component we talked about last week are these. Halamita algae that, that when they decompose the calcare the calcium skeletons form a big part of the sand which is washed over the beach. 
And then uh, also, uh, most recently, we've come to realize that when Carl's bleach, if they recover, where do they get the algae, the zooxanthellae? And it turns out that a lot of the zooxanthellae the, the, that are in the seawater, sea free living, are consumed <clears throat> incidentally by fish. Uh, they're excreted, but they're still viable. And when they're taken in by the, the coral, those uh, algae are utilized. Uh, real quickly on, on uh, fishy sex, there are three methods. What you see here with the, with the clownfish, these are sequential hermaphrodites, meaning there'll be a harem of females dominated by a single male. And when the male gets eaten or dies, the most mature female will become male. So basically, Nemo didn't have to go searching for his mama because his daddy would have become his mama, you know, had he stuck around. Then there's a rare case of what's known as simultaneous hermaphrodism. Uh, the hamlets are the most common. This is a sequence I found from Bonaire. And what they will do near sunset is they'll engage in what's referred to as a spawning rush. <clears throat> they both can produce eggs and sperm. So they are, they are simultaneously hermaphroditic. And they will exchange roles as they rise to the water column, sometimes uh, ejecting sperm, sometimes ejecting eggs. Uh, but more commonly, it's sequential. And, and one example of, of how remarkable this can be, uh, what you're seeing are spotlight parrotfish. And if you're seeing them looking like spotlights, you're seeing them in the female phase, sometimes immature males, but mostly these are females. When they progress to the, uh, the terminal male, as it's called, they look like you see on the bottom. Uh, but not, not all fish spawn and really and broadcast their eggs. Uh, some actually will brood. And the most commonly seen are the, the sergeant majors. And here you see the little purplish masses. These are actually sergeant major eggs, where, which the males will protect prodigiously. And they will, uh, they will defend these egg patches, which are quite common normally in the spring of the year. On the lower left, you see jawfish, which are mouth brooders. And the males will actually brood them in the mouths until, until they hatch. And then I wanted to finally conclude with some of the implications and the reason that, that fisheries management is important. We found that when fish get bigger, particularly females, they don't just have a few more eggs. They have exponentially more eggs. So as you see here, you know, a fish just a little bit larger, doubly in size, has 15 times more eggs. And in some species, it's 100 times. So what this means is the, the big mamas, the largest females particularly, but the males to an extent, are just too reproductively important to take out of the system, which is why some countries uh, have in their fisheries regulations what are known as slot limits. A slot limit is that you have to take, a, let's say I have a slot limit of 24 to 30. You can't take the fish until it's 24 because it has to get that big reproduce. But then once it gets to 30 inches, it's just too important from its reproductive capacity to take it at all. So you can only take, for example, in, uh, in Florida, you can only take a snook between the, the range of about, I think, 24 inches to about 32 inches. So it's important to keep the big mamas there. They're just too darn important. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that we've changed our understanding of the nature of, coral, of fish ecology quite a bit. And when coral reef science began pretty much after the advent of scuba in the late 50s, we saw reefs and we saw this kind of structure where you had lots and lots of herbivores very few apex predators, just like on the African savanna with wildebeest and lions. And we thought that was pretty much normal. And we called these reefs pristine reefs of, in Jamaica, for example, in particular, where a lot of the seminal research was done on coral reefs. But then later, <clears throat> only a decades or a few before, we finally began exploring truly pristine, meaning <clears throat> areas where very few humans had 
encroached first in the northwestern uh, Hawaiian Islands. I, I, I won't attempt to pr pronounce the name of the uh, monument. <clears throat> and then later in the remote Pacific areas. And what the, the take home here is the food webs looked very different. In these areas that were truly untouched by humans, predators were actually the most conspicuous and sometimes by a major factor. And while this looks like it's impossible because you can't have more energy come, being produced than you have energy putting in, uh, they finally realized that the, her, the, the smaller fish were being consumed and reproducing so quickly, they simply were taken out soon after they were put into the system. And so I think the upshot from this is if you are looking at a truly healthy coral reef system, you should be seeing lots of high level predators. In fact, my, my comment is always, if you don't see sharks, you're not seeing a healthy ecosystem. And I, find, I also wanted to emphasize that coral reef fish, fisheries are very, very easily over, overfished. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, you would think all of the productivity of a coral reef would give rise to a lot of potential fish being taken from it. But there are just too many mouths to feed on the coral reef. There's not a lot of surplus left over. And so, in fact, the, the coral reef fishery worldwide only accounts for about 10% of the global catch. We need to be really, really careful and be responsible with regard to what we eat. Recently, uh, the Bay Islands down in, in uh, uh, Honduras, one of their NGOs has released this uh, guide to uh, tropical seafood. And you'll notice it's suggesting particularly that we avoid eating uh, groupers because of their, uh, their overfishing, uh, snappers, parrotfishes, and in their case, triggerfishes. They have a, a, a problem with triggerfishes in there. Bottom line, opt for the pelagic fish, the fish that tend to spend a lot of time in the deep water. Uh, it's a better choice. And please, please, I, I was appalled to see this. We don't like to see anyone ever, ever targeting parrotfish. If you're really interested in this, I would encourage you to uh, take a look at the uh, uh, Reef Environmental, or, uh, Environmental Education Foundation <coughs> site and their fish surveyor program. It's a, a wonderful long uh, term program, the, the largest aquatic uh, citizen science program currently in the world. And if you're interested, uh, chapter six of my book gets into, believe it or not, much more detail than I talked about here. So please look at that. So uh, we're running a little late on time, so I'll go through this last se sequence before we turn to some questions. <coughs> St. Lucia is what I wanted to talk about uh, with these upcoming trips to be specific. Uh, in case you're unaware, uh, St. Lucia is in the lower Antilles, you see circled here. And notice that there is an arc to the islands from Cuba down to Tobago. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, these islands are always very, all very mountainous, as you see here. And that has bearing, as we'll see in a minute. Now, the reason the coral reefs in the lower in the Antilles are fundamentally different than places such as the Bahamas or the Florida Keys or, or Cozumel is that they were formed through plate tectonics. Uh, you may remember from general science at some point that the earth is, the crust of the earth is constructed by these plates that move about, colliding, diverging, et cetera. And the Caribbean plate you see here is bordered by uh, the uh, South American plate, the North American plate, the, the, the Cocos and the Nazca plate. And you want to pay attention particularly to that northeastern side. Because you have two plates coming together, one, the North American, diving beneath the other, and the enormous amount of energy and seawater that's pulled beneath generates the heat that gives rise to these mountains and volcanoes. And that's the reason the Antilles exist because of this tectonic activity. And if you remember the, the Jamaican earthquake, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Haiti earthquake, the uh, Montserrat event, et cetera, this is noted. And what's also kind of interesting and kind of unique, you wonder about what is the, we hear about the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean in the middle of the Pacific. Well, here's the deepest part of the Atlantic. 
It's just north of Puerto Rico, the Milwaukee Deep. It's 28, over 28,000 feet deep. And the reason it's the deepest part is you have these converging plates that the enormous energy between the two fold and dive down into the depths, forming these deepest parts. And the lower Antilles, I think you can see my cursor here, we're looking at this area down here. So this is why you have this very unique uh, kind of topography, very, very different uh, uh, coral reef uh, systems. Uh, historically, you can just kind of see here, this, these, were, uh, these islands, of course, were home to native populations, uh, particularly the, the Caribs, which were the more aggressive uh, uh, <coughs> Indian uh, uh, of the era. They, uh, the French settled it and had it for a long time. Uh, they managed to at least uh, uh, have a treaty with the Caribs. Uh, however, they lost it with the fall of Napoleon and it became an English uh, uh, possession essentially to 1979. They're one of the, one of the, one of the uh, last uh, countries to uh, uh, declare independence. They're also famous from the standpoint of their commitment to marine resource management. They were they are a real success story in the Caribbean and they have a, a program there of uh, marine reserves and zoned according to use. They have a strong commitment to fisheries uh, management there. Uh, these are not just paper parks there. They're, they're very proud of what they've, what they've done in the past 20 years or so with regard to their uh, marine re their coastal resources. And uh, uh, Megan uh, Oswald was kind enough to send me some input and that uh, there were rumors at one point, I think until someone photographed it, of what they used to call the thing. Uh, and this is actually a polychaete worm, a segmented worm uh, in the, uh, the genus uh, Eunus, it's Eunus rosi. And uh, these craters can get uh, over six feet long and they look uh, pretty menacing. Uh, uh, I don't think there's necessarily a need to be, <laughs> to be concerned, but they are. Uh, can be quite frightening if you don't expect them. Now, the, the reason I bring this up is that one of its relatives, this is Rosii, and uh, Eunice Aphrodias is uh, also known as the bobbit worm. So here is a bobbit worm from uh, Lembe Straits in uh, Indonesia. It's being baited. And here's one of the reasons that we hope that uh, <coughs> bobbits do not occur in the Atlantic. So don't worry about this, this critter. So that is it. Sorry for going over a bit. And uh, if you do have any follow-up questions that we can't get to, you got my email. Uh, please join us uh, next month. It'll be the fourth as opposed to the third Wednesday. And we're going to delve into lionfish in some pretty meticulous detail because there have been a lot of interesting developments with regard to uh, the lionfish invasion of the Atlantic. And with that, I'll see if we have any questions. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Thank you, Alex, for um, for your conversation. I it cut out when you were talking about the relationship between the zooxanthellae and right. the other kind of parrotfish. Can you uh, explicate on that? Oh uh, well, it, it was it was rec it was suspected for a while that you know before these algae get into the t the tissues of the coral, they exist in the water column. They're 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 dinoflagellates, so they have the little spinning you know flagella, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so they know that there's a source out there. The question is, are the are the corals capturing them? Uh, from the water column, uh, how many are coming from their their parents from the from the gametes originally, and it was suspected that there would be other uh, avenues. And uh, one of the suspected sources was uh, fecal material from fishes, and this confirmed that in fact that f f somehow these little dinoflagellates can survive that that transit through the gut uh, and remain viable, so that when uh, particulate from that, the fecal matter is consumed by the corals, uh, they can identify the, the dinoflagellate as the right species and uh, encapsulate it as they do and, and put it into their tissues and make it a little food factory. So it's kind of, it's it was a suspicion that was uh, confirmed uh, through this and other, other research. And if you go to the 
uh, <clears throat> the website page, you'll see the, the link to the news item and the news item will have the paper uh, that the uh, uh, news item is based upon. So it's just another little nuance of call of ecology and, you know, as disgusting as coprophagy sounds, it's a, it's an important function in the yeah. ecosystems. Definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, thanks everyone for joining in today. We hope everyone can join in next month as well. Um, if you think of any questions along the way, you can email me at sabrina.severin at diventures.com or Alex, and we'd be happy to answer those questions. So thanks everyone. Hope you have a great Wednesday. Thanks for taking the time, folks. It was a pleasure, as always.